All right, y'all ready for the word on today? I believe God has a word for us. And I want to talk from the topic today. Y'all ready for the topic? Our subject today is make it make sense, Jesus. Make it make sense. Can you tell somebody who's sitting to you, next to you or if you're on your couch at home, just say it out. Say, make it make sense. Make it make sense, Jesus. This is what we're talking about today. And um, before we get into it, I just want to know if there's anybody else in the audience that, like, that's like me. Have you ever been misunderstood? Have you ever had somebody just misunderstand you? Just like you try to do things nice and they take it another way and you thought you was coming across one way and they read it a whole other way. Anybody ever been misunderstood? Am I in the right room? I got, a, I, got a, I got a funny story about a time that I was super misunderstood. Okay, the situation, and I was on the freeway, right? And usually I am kind of an irritated driver. Usually I am. But this day I wasn't. I was in the car. I was with my oldest son. We were driving together. Just so happened my song came on. I mean, like my song. Like I hadn't heard this song in years. And I was feeling it. I was like, okay, let's go. At the same time that my song came on, um, someone cut me off. I was in a, but I was like, it's my song. I'm, I'm doing it. You know, I'm just driving like, oh, it's okay. All right. That's how we live in sins. Okay, good. But the way, I'm, I'm very expressive, if you can't tell. And I was feeling my song. I was like, ah, ah, yeah, ah. And I was doing all the parts and pointing and stuff. She looked in the rearview mirror and must have thought that I was being demonstrative towards her. Really, I had let it go. I was like, it's whatever. I hadn't heard the song or whatever. And I was just, mm, mm, and you feel me? And uh, uh, and I was doing all the things and she must have looked back, got back over, put, slammed her brakes, cussed me out, got back in front of me, got in front. This is just the thing. I was like, okay, sis. This is the other thing she did. She rolled down her window. She was in front of me. She had some Gatorade. I guess she, was, she started throwing the Gatorade out the window. I was like, sis. And then it got even worse than that. Then she threw the bottle out the window. All because... I was, I was jamming. I was. I was feeling it. But it was a misunderstood a misunderstanding. She misunderstood my expression and thought I was trying to try to get at her. And I really wasn't being misunderstood. Has anybody ever felt like that? That's how we, this is a, it's our part of our human experience. And I'm so glad that we serve a savior who understands what it's like to be misunderstood. Amen. In our verse today, we're going to see Jesus was kind of in the same predicament. He was in a situation where he was being misunderstood. And I'm going to read this first passage from uh, Luke 15, but in the message version. Luke 15, 1 through 3, in the message version. It says, um, by this time, a lot of men and women of questionable reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and religious scholars were not pleased, not pleased at all. They growled. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Jesus over here acting like it's cheers. Everybody know your name. Every time somebody come in, Jesus was like, what's up, Zacchaeus? I'm just imagining Bible names. They were in their hearts they were saying, make it make sense, Jesus. Why are you hanging with these people? I see, I thought you was on our level. You supposed to be the Messiah. If you was the Messiah, you would know we all fool with them. Like, what kind of Messiah are you? Like, what are we doing? Make it make sense, Jesus. We don't understand. Why would you hang with them? Why would you be with them? Like, we don't do that. Don't you know you're supposed to be one of us? You got to join our club. To be, you know, one of the elite. Make it make sense. They even called him in Luke 7. They called, our, they called our savior a glutton, a drunker, and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. A friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, there are many names for Jesus that I love in the Bible. Amen. Maybe y'all can finish some of these sentences. Jesus is the lily of the? He's the bright and moaning. He's the alpha and water when I'm. Bread when I'm mother to the, father to the, friend to the. That look.
look at all these names for Jesus. Y'all been in church for a minute. Y'all got an A today. There's a lot of names for Jesus, but this is the name of Jesus that don't get a lot of shine. Friend of sinners. Why we don't got a song for that, Lauren? Every time we don't got a song, I'll be like, Lauren, why we ain't got a song? <laughs> oh, okay. On the fly. Yes, Lord. Sing it. Why we don't got, why don't we celebrate this part of Jesus? The, the, the name that they gave him, friend of sinners. That one don't get a lot of shine. You know why? Because it was actually supposed to be an insult. It was a backhanded compliment. Anybody ever got a backhanded compliment? Oh, girl, you look cute today. Oh, you finally got a haircut. You know what I mean? A backhanded compliment. This is what this was. Jesus had um, this thing about him where they were like, mm, we don't, this, we going to give you a new label. And in my mind, I was like, what's the big deal? Why he can't eat with the folks? Like, what, why y'all so, why y'all so irritated at that? Like, why, like, if you read through the book of Luke, every time he eating with people, they just all up in the roar. Like, look at him eating with people. What's the big, what's the big, why was this such a big deal? It says that the Pharisees and the scribes, they adhered to the law. They were guardians of tradition. They were examples of piety, and they loved their vaulted positions. They avoided all who were deemed sinners and did not follow their systems. They avoided them. So in the Jewish rule book, it was called the Talmud. They, had, um, they named the certain people as sinners. Like, I'm going to give y'all the list of sinners. Now, you tell me what race or group of people this sound like. I'm not going to say who it could be, but you tell me when you hear this list of sinners, you tell me what, who they sound like. All right, y'all ready? Here's the list of sinners. Dice players. Who that, who that sound like to y'all? I'm just saying. Dice players was the, the pigeon racers. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Loan sharks, dealers of produce on a sabbatical year. Remember on the sab sabbatical year, you're supposed to take the year off. Don't sell nothing. Don't cultivate nothing. They had my, my hustle man out there still <laughs> selling the fruit off the, I got figs for $3. Like, you weren't supposed to do that. Herdsmen, which is so amazing. Herdsmen were shepherds, which Jesus, when he was born, God first appeared to shepherds who were considered sinners and outsiders. I'm sensing a pattern here. Uh, customs officials, prostitutes, tax collectors. I ain't going to say who that might sound like. Tax collectors were like dope dealers of this day. The ones who sold out, for the, sold out themselves to the community because they wanted to make money. They'd rather sell things to the poison in our community and make money off of it and live well. Same as tax collectors, same thing. They was sellouts, giving all their money to, to Rome and making money off people, all right? So I don't know, that kind of sounds like black folks to me, but I'm just gonna keep moving. <laughs> they were notoriously bad characters, and because they were, they were not in the habit of studying and practicing the traditions of the elders, they were shunned. Now, I want to tell you about the table. Why was it such a big deal? In ancient Israel, the table was a place where spiritual points were taught and where fellowship occurred. The dinner was often uh, called a banquet, a meal where people reclined. Like you was chilling at a banquet. Like, you would be up close and back to back on somebody, close up, like laying on their legs, or, you know, you real close in this, in this uh, thing. And um, eating with someone established a covenant relationship, a friendship, which was normally a sign of approval. So for a Pharisee to eat with sinners or a tax collector was to defile oneself. Righteousness came through purity and separation from sinners. The issue of eating with sinners was sensitive in Juda Judaism um, since eating with people conveyed that you accepted their sins. Jesus prefers pursuing relationships that might lead sinners to God rather than quarantining himself. Can you see what's happening here? They was like, the more we're going to separate from you, the more bad you are, the more we're going to separate from you because you're going to make me unclean. That's why it seems, seems kind of sounds like our religion, right? We separate from people instead of being one with them. So 
this is why they were like saying, God, make it make sense. Jesus, why make it make sense? Have you ever felt like this? Have you ever had a time in your life when you said, God, make it make sense? God, make it make sense. Why am I going through this? God, what's happening? You want me to forgive who? Oh, you want me to forgive? You want me to love who? You know what they did to me? Make it make sense. Oh, I got to be, I got to be the one that's nice all the time. Oh, I got to be the bigger person. Make it make sense, Lord. Oh, I'm supposed to turn the cheek. Oh, make it make sense. Have you ever had that moment where you're asking God, make it make sense? Where might you be misunderstanding Jesus in your life? See, they misunderstood Jesus' purpose and his role. What's going on in your life? Are you misunderstanding? understanding what Jesus is doing, that trial you're going through, that sickness, that hardship. Maybe God's really doing something in your life. Are we misunderstanding? All right, so that was just a setup. I just wanted you to see who Jesus was, a friend of a sinner's. Now, this is the thing I like about Jesus. Jesus had clapbacks. Somebody say clapbacks. So in Luke 15, 1, we're going to read Jesus' clapback. And I love God because I just want to do a whole sermon series on clapbacks. Jesus' top ten clapbacks. This is one of them. It says, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him. I love that because they were drawing near to him. They were drawing. They were drawn to Jesus. Jesus had to be hecka cool, y'all. His personality had to be, like, on point. Like, he had to be friendly and laughable and, and just a good-natured and gregarious. He had to be heck of cool because people were drawn to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. You know what Jesus' answer was? So he told him a parable. He's like your favorite uncle that always got a story for something, right? Jesus, I love this about Jesus. Oh, yo, oh you want to know why I hang out with sinners? Oh, okay, I got a story for you. Let me tell you something, right? He goes on to tell them three stories. Three stories. How many? Three stories. In reaction to their grumbling, Jesus gave them three stories. The first one was about a lost sheep. There was a lost sheep. Um, it was found, and there was great rejoicing, all right? Second one was a lost coin. The lost coin, the lady lost her coin. She tore up her house looking for it. She turned it upside. You know how you are when you can't find your keys? That's what she did. She, it was a set of coins. One was missing, and the coin represent the image. There was an image of a king on the coin. So there was an image bearer on the coin. She was looking, tearing up her whole house. When she found it, there was rejoicing. Third story was a lost son, right? The lost son was out. We noticed the story as a prodigal son. And when he is found, there's a great celebration. Y'all sensing the theme? And each time it says, heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. Kept saying it. It's a theme here, all right? So I want to just, just bear down really quick on the last story that he told about something lost, the lost son. We refer to it as a prodigal son, and we usually use it as a standalone story. Whenever you hear it preached or taught, it's usually like, this is the story. We say it without a lot of context. But if you really look at it, it was an answer to the complaints. Why are you hanging out with these people? I got a story for you. Here's a boy that was lost. It really should be renamed because the prodigal son is really not the main character. It could be, it should be renamed the parable of the salty brother. That's what it could be. It could be the salty brother. Okay, so we're going to pick this story up. We're not gonna, you all y'all know the story of the prodigal son. He like, give me my money. I want my money and I want it now. And he goes out, he lives a whole crazy lifestyle. Um, he's wasted in on prostitutes and doing all kinds. He was in strip clubs. He was doing, I, that might, I might have read into that. But he, he, he lost all his money. He ends up in a pig pen, which is crazy for a Jewish boy to be in a pig pen. That was totally like, that's not what you do. He comes to himself. He's like, I'm going back home. His father sees him like, what's up? The father runs to him in anticipation, brings him back. Hey, let's do a party. I'm going to give you a robe, sandals, all that. We're going to pick up on the story. This is like season five if we were watching The Prodigal Son on Netflix, all right? Picking up on verse 25. It's some reading to it, so y'all okay with reading? You know, we, uh, y'all, did y'all read 
this week, now I got you. We're going to do our Bible reading this week. All right, here we go. Picking up on verse 25, this is uh, Luke 15. And go. All right. We there? Oh, there it is. There it is. Verse 25. Yes. It says, now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, hey, what's going on? He, realized, he replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. All right. Verse 28. Then he became, what? Angry and refused to go in. His father came out. And pleaded and, and came out and began to plead with him. Verse 29. But he answered his father. Check this out. Listen, I got something to say. For all these years, I have been working like a slave for you. And I've never disobeyed your command. Yet, you have never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, not my brother, when this son of yours came back, who, was devou who devoured our property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours who was dead has come to life, he was lost, and has been found. Amen, amen. I want you to look at this in the context of how it was presented. This is Jesus' rebuttal to why do you hang out with sinners? Now, a lot of times when we hear the stories, we tend to put ourselves into the story, right? All right, so um, who do, but before we do that, who do you think, the eldest son represented in the story. Who was he doing the like, you know, the Instagram when you be doing the little comments and it's to somebody, but you ain't really trying to say who it is to? Yeah, what, he was third, third party, and that's what Jesus was doing. Who, who was he talking to? Who was the eldest son? Who was it? Who was he talking about? The Pharisees. That's who he was. He was like, y'all see the correlation? Y'all are the oldest son. You are been with God. You are oldest to this. Y'all have been in covenant with God. But there's some new things coming. Something's younger coming, and y'all a little salty about it. Now, when you hear the story, where do you usually put yourself? We, we love to be the son. Oh, Jesus, I done done wrong, Lord. I've been out doing all the things. Take me back. Fred Hammond wrote a song about it. Yes, it was a wonderful song. Um, we usually put ourselves in the place of the sun. Or if you're kind of in uh, white evangelical spaces, you probably think you're the father. You're going around rescuing and saving everybody and handing out the salvations to all. No, no, no. That's not the, that's not the place of us. That's not our place in the story. We are one of two things, and we always relate to the prodigal, but rather never do we be honest and say, I, I'm, sometimes I can be that older brother. Sometimes that is me. Sometimes I don't like the way God do things. You know, it's called the older brother syndrome, the older son syndrome. Any oldest kids in here? Anybody the older? Uh-huh, look at you. Y'all still mad. Y'all still mad and stuff. Why you mad? That's right. You're mad because what did your parents do? They let them do whatever they want. All the whoopings you got, they did not. If you're a youngest child, raise your hand. Oh, yeah, y'all got away with everything. They salty at you the same way. Because it's the older brother syndrome. It's the oldest son syndrome. The older brother represents the pharisaical attitude that re uh, resents God's interest in sinners. The same attitude the early church had when they were looking suspiciously at the Gentiles. Y'all can't have salvation. This is for us. His self-righteousness manifested itself in jealousy and envy. And today, the elder son is like those who in self-righteousness shun people who do not live up to their standards of righteousness. Sound familiar? Sounds like what we've been doing in church for a long time. 
like telling people that you're not dressed right, you don't look right, what you got on, where your pay, well, what you doing? Like, no, you can't come in here. Who you love? No. What you, who you marry? No, you can't have you in here. What you smell like? No, you can't come in here. This is the older son, older sibling syndrome. Self-righteous Pharisee did not recognize their need for forgiveness and salvation. Why? Because they trusted in their own legalistic observance of rituals and rules. They was like, if I just do enough, this is what's going to make God love me. It's the older brother syndrome, the older son syndrome. It will make you feel entitled. Sometimes we can feel entitled. This is my question. How you going to be mad at how the father spent his own wealth? Huh? Who's you mad at, little boy? <laughs> you mad because what, what belongs to you in this story? It's the father's to give. It's always been the father. God, the uh, younger brother's like, give me my hair. And he's like, oh, here you go. Oh, now I want my son. How you going to regulate the dad's pockets? You count his money. How you doing that? It makes you feel entitled, and we can have this sense too. Like God owes me something. Been coming to this church, been giving, been trying to live right, and this how you going to do me, God? This You owe me. Isn't that how we feel a lot of times? We feel entitled. And then the, the older son, son syndrome will make you want the fatted calf on your terms. He was like, where am I fatted calf? You know, the fatted calf is the thing that they would train and groom all year. They fatten it up, feed it all kind of stuff, just so they can have a good barbecue when it was time. He was like, I've been here this whole time. You didn't save them. I want my fatted calf. Where's my, where's my just dues? I want it on my terms, and I want it now. The older son syndrome will make you look the part, but inwardly your heart is just as messed up as the prodigal. See, he looked the part. I did. What was his speech? I've been here working, slaving. He doing around, doing whatever. I've been holding it down. I've been doing all the work. Look at you. He doing all the things. But inside, he was just as messed up and in the pig pen in his heart. He couldn't even be happy that his brother came home because of everything that he felt he, he was old and he was entitled to. This is the older brother syndrome, and this is what we don't want to be a part of. Um, we never, you know what I love about this too? The older brother thought the father's acceptance would come from how he obeyed, but the father loved them both, not based on their behavior, but just because they existed, just because they were his, because they were his children. Just because they were, he loved them both, no matter what. And you know what I love about the story as I'm wrapping up? We never hear the end of it. Go back and read in Luke 15. We don't know what happened. At the end, that was the end of the story. He's like, hey, well, you want to come back in or not? And then we don't know what happened. I love that because it leads us up to us to, like, what are, what, what are you going to do? It's what, what's your invitation that makes it, puts it back on us. So this, 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 my friend, this is why it made sense. This is what Jesus did. Jesus was a friend to sinners. He came to seek and save the lost. Unlike Pharisees, Jesus didn't require people to change before they came to him. <laughs> he sought them out. He met them where they were. He extended grace to them. Now, I just want to point out that it was strategic. Amen. Somebody say strategic. Jesus went out here kicking it for kicking its sake. So I need to, I need to put that in because somebody going to take this too far and be like, I heard a message from Pastor Nisha and I'm about to call up all the homies and we about to get up. It's about to be lit. That's not what I'm saying. What Jesus did was strategic. Jesus, Jesus' perfect purpose in befriending befriend, befriending sinners was not to join them in their sin, but to save them from it. Jesus, he didn't come to earth to indulge in sin, but to call sinners to repentance. This was Jesus, this is what Jesus was trying to do. Jesus was trying to show people God's heart. 
I was just trying to show you his heart. If you read Luke 15, I'm just trying to show you the guy's heart. Y'all got him all messed up. Y'all got him, y'all thinking about God the wrong way. Y'all looking at God with a lightning bolt in his hand. You thinking God looking, keeping a ledger of all your rights and wrong. I'm trying to show you God's heart. Do you want to know what God is like? This is what Jesus, you want to know what God is like? God is like a scavenger. God loves to go hunt for lost things. He loves it. Leaves the 99. Finds just the one sheep goes astray, and I'm going to leave it all to find that one person. This is God's heart. Loves to look for stuff. Loves to look for people. Loves lost things. Loves to search out. Now, he wasn't like lazy looking, you know, the parable of the coin. She flipped her house upside down. Side note. On those three stories, who did the shepherd represent in that story? Who was that? Who was the shepherd that leaves the 99? It's not a, a trick question. Mm-hmm. It represents God, right? God that leaves the 99 goes at. Who, who, who was the woman? Who does the woman represent? Oh, all right. It represents God. I'm just going to leave that right there. I'm leave that right there. God used the illustration of a woman. To show what God is like. I'm going to leave that right there. That was for free. So God is a scavenger. What is God like? I don't know if y'all ready for this one. God likes to party. Are y'all ready for that? Y'all ready to see God in that context? Read Luke 15 on your own this whole week. Every single parable ended with a party. Come rejoice with me. Come on, celebrate. Come on, let's just say the angels rejoice. All of heaven is rejoicing if just one person turns. God likes to party. I don't know where we got the idea where God is like um, tight-lipped and scald face and sucking on lemons. No, our God loves finding lost things. And when God finds the lost, when one person turns back, when someone repents, God's heart is to rejoice to celebrate. What is God like? God loves to extend lavish. Somebody say lavish. Lavish love and grace, even to those who break the rules. Lavish. God is always pouring it out. It makes no sense. Like there's another parable where um, and Jesus is like, there's um, the the kingdom of heaven is like when a vineyard, a guy owns a vineyard and he hires people to work. And then you guys remember that one? And the people who worked, the people who worked in the beginning of the day got the same pay as the people who worked for the last five minutes. And the people that worked all day was all salty. It's like, how come they get what we got? They, they just showed up. And the whole purpose of the parable was like, how are you going to tell me what to do with my money? How you, why will you be mad if I'm generous? Why are you mad if I'm generous? So what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And I'm closing with this. What can we do in response to this message? We can join God in the hunt. Amen? We're going to join God in the hunt. We are not the saviors, but we're going to join God in the hunt. We're going to really intently go after and look for lost people, lost things. And we're not going to look like our kids look when you're trying to, when they clean it up. Any parents in here, when you tell your kids to go get something and they can't find it, or you go look for it, And they just like halfway look. That's not how we going to do. That was a whooping in my house. Like if if I find it, if I find it, it's going to, sorry, I got uh, memories. Sorry. But we're not going to look like kids look and just like halfway. We're going to be very intentional to join God in the hunt. What else can we do? We can be distributors of God's lavish love and grace. We can distribute it. Anybody remember old school Amway? Did y'all, was anybody an Amway distributor? <laughs> was your grandmother one, your auntie somebody? Y'all remember, and my two old, y'all, uh, young people are like, what is Amway? What is a- Avon? Oh, yeah. See, you didn't make the, the, the stuff, but you distributed it. You can take credit for making that lip gloss and bubble bath. You didn't do that. But you were a distributor. This is what God wants to use us to be a distributor of his love, to be a distributor of his grace, to, of, of his lavish love, should I say. Let's be generous with the salvation 
that's not even ours to give. Why are we so stingy with God's salvation? Why are we acting like it ain't enough for everybody? Why are we like, no, you can only have a little? It don't even belong to us. It belongs to our, our Heavenly Father, our parent who is lavish, who is always willing to give it out, that has no you know, stoppage, no shortage, and we want to meet it out to people. What, was you being good this week? Mm-hmm. We want to send people to hell so bad, to a heaven and a hell that we don't even have keys to. Let's be generous with our salvation. There's no us versus them. Y'all know that? That's what happened with the Pharisees. They got a little, you know, rules in them. And they felt like we better than them. Do y'all know it's all us? Like, you're, you're either, like, I know we sing, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was found. Yes. But we were all ex-loss. Amen? We're all in the same category. We found, the Lord found us. And now it's our responsibility to go find the other ones. Where are, it's no us versus them. We're, we were all, all lost, and now we're found, and now we're going back to get some more lost people. Not, y'all come on, get on our level. Where did we get the, where, when did it, where did we go wrong, y'all? The last thing we need to do is check our hearts. You need, we got to check our hearts, because how do we feel when God lavishes on those we don't think deserve it? How do we feel when God chooses to give grace to people? Are we happy when God gives grace to the person you was waiting for them to get paid back on? Like, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop because you know they did me shady. Karma going to get them. Like, when we be lightweight, happy, like, what happened? Mm-hmm, I knew it. We want this. It's something about us we want it, but what, when are we going to be a, a generous distributor of God's love and grace and not wait for something to happen to people, even the people who don't, we feel that don't deserve it. This is why it makes sense, y'all. Jesus said, I didn't come for the healthy. The healthy don't need a doctor. I've come to call the righteous and the sinners to repentance. So it makes sense to go after the ones. It makes sense to go after people who are just like us. It, it makes sense to welcome and befriend those who break the rules. It makes sense. You should be getting some side eyes every now and then if people being like, why are you going out to eat with them? Who the? We should be getting every now and then people like, you going out to lunch with who? Oh, okay. Who you having at your house? Y'all having dinner? We, 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 we're not getting enough side eyes. We got to have people to look at us and be like, I'm wondering about your friend group. Like, how did you become friends with them? This is our goal. This is our goal as a church. Amen. This is going to be a place of belonging. This is going to be a place where people are not othered. This will be a place where we're going after the lost and the ex-lost and the people who are just like us. We're not going to forget our testimony and act like we're so much better than everybody. Once God's did a work in us, this is going to be the place where God can rejoice in those who turn to him. Amen. So let's just stand. We're going to close in prayer. Let's close in prayer. Make it make sense, Jesus. Jesus, you made it make sense. You are the friend of sinners. And we want to have that same reputation. We want this to be our mission at this church, God. We want people to see how much you love them, how much you pursue them, how much you go after them. Even when we mess up, even when we find ourselves in pig pens, even when we, we are lost, God, let us be distributors of your lavish love and grace. Let us not withhold what you give freely. God, let us not condemn people to eternal hells over things that we don't know anything about that's going on in their lives. God, we bless you on today. We pray that you would, we would internalize this word. And if you're listening today, either online or if you're here, and you feel like I, I, I'm lost, I feel lost. If this is you, I, like, I feel like I'm that lost sheep. I'm the coin. I'm the son. I'm even the older brother who I want God on my terms, and I want God to look at my righteousness. But 
I'm coming to you today, God, because I want to be found by you. We don't find God. God finds us. So if that's you and you're like, God, I, I'm, I want to be found by you. I surrender. I don't want to hide no more. I'm not going to tuck myself away. I'm not going to wander off. I'm not going to go to a strange land. But, God, I want you. I want you, oh, God. If that's you, just say, God, I want you. God, I, I need you. Thank you, God, for finding me. Thank you for rejoicing over me. I want to follow you all the days of my life. I, I believe that you are Lord. I believe that you died and rose. And, and Lord, I just want to, I want you in my life. So today is the day I'm saying I want to follow you. Thank you, oh God. Thank you that you love lost things. Thank you that you found us. Come on, if you're happy that God found you, can you just begin to give God a praise, a wave, a clap? Say, thank you, God. Thank you for saving me. God, I was lost. I was on my way to an eternal hell, God. I was on my way to destruction. I was had bad habits. I had bad attitudes. I had addictions. I was doing the wrong thing. But it was you, God. You found me. You turned my life around. God, I just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you, God. Thank you for salvation. Thank you that you came to find me. You left the 99 and you found me. You turned over a house for me, oh God. God, you ran towards me when I came back to you. So, God, we are forever grateful. Change our hearts. We don't want to be like the older brother, God. We want to rejoice with what you, we want your heart, God. When people come into this place, when they come into the Way Christian Center, let us rejoice. Let them feel like they're home. Let them feel like they belong and they are valued because they exist. So we give you the glory and all the honor, and all the praise, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on, will you give the Lord a great big hand praise? Hallelujah.